Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. I like to work a horse, so because I like it, I'm gonna be better at it than something I don't really like, you know, or don't like as well. And so, you know, I just, when you've got an aptitude for something, an appreciation of it, you're always gonna be more resourceful and, you know, try harder, so. I got started logging, um, my, my dad's got a farm in Newton County over east of here and uh, maybe 10, 10 or 12 years ago, um, you know, the red oak borer got in there and started chewing on the timber. So we didn't want it to go to waste. So we got in and started working our own timber there at that farm in Newton County. And dad bought a little bandsaw mill and we, cut a lot of timber and, and milled it ourselves. Uh, and I just really liked, I was about 17, I think, when we were doing that. And I just really enjoyed working in the woods. And um, so since then, I've always kept some kind of logging outfit one way or the other. And I was always interested in horses and mules. We were working tractor a lot of that time. And then about coming on two years ago, I got, um, a pair of mules and started into to logging with the mules and, and then I got these horses and uh, I just really like it the best of all. Uh, if I could hire on and just work a team or just cut timber for somebody that was logging in the way that I want to work, I would probably. I don't, um, I really enjoy simplicity. And what I've come to find that, you know, uh, a really good hired hand sometimes will, in the clear year after year, make not too far off from what the guy owning the outfit will make, at least in my scale of operation. That may be different when you're doing 100 loads a week in South Arkansas or something, but in this country with a small outfit, you know, you have to pay your help pretty good, you know, and so if you're a really good hand and you're making it by the volume, you know, I'll, yeah, I'll make more owning the company, but not so much more that, you know, I just, I just own my own outfit because there's nobody left that'll work side loaders and horses to hire me. <laughs> and so I've got to run my own show if I want to work the way I want to work. And everybody says, well, I don't want to, all the loggers that I talk to, you know, they all kind of like what I do. You know, down at the sawmill, I'm friends with everybody. We're all 
it's a pretty good environment down there and and they kind of I think they all appreciate what I do but they also will tease me you know well, I don't want to work horses because you got to work as hard as that horse does and I laugh and I don't ever really say this but you know to me the cutting the timber like running a saw cutting timber that's that's just as physically demanding as working a horse as loading the truck you know it's it's as hard as any part of that job well i i gotta fill that bunk on that truck one time a day per man right okay if you're running a skitter and all this and you you know and say maybe you've got you know a tandem axle with two bunks and then a pup with a bunk well there's three bunks so that's three times what i'm doing and by the time to pay for all that equipment you know you're in the way i look at it to make your money you're you're working three times harder you know, the same bunk that I had to cut with a chainsaw that was as hard as any part of my day, well, they're having to cut that three times to make that money, you right. know. And so, and again, it's a preference deal. Most most people anymore, they prefer that. And I don't knock that, you know. Um, that's just fine. And But to me, I don't think it's any harder work than anybody yeah. else logging. I think logging is just hard work. It's a, it's a big thing, and, you know, I, I see a lot of parallels with, like, the dairy industry. You know, like, milk don't pay, you know, the, the price of milk goes down. Okay, well, i got to produce this much more to make that same money, you know, and it goes on and on and on, and it's the same absolutely with logging. And the I would say the biggest negative impact that has come with that general trajectory is the mini logging, you know, these scrag block mills. So back like, I think it was, in, it was before my time, but in the 80s, uh, one of these families, the sawmilling families in our area, brought in this mini mill. And what it is, is uh, it's a mill that can utilize small diameter timber for producing pallet stock, which at the time seemed like a good idea. You know, you've got all the these little small tops in the trees that before were too small to cut a tie out of, so you just left them. Well, we'll use more of the tree. That sounds good. But what ended up happening was that, and this may have been the design all the time, I don't know, but uh, once there became a market, and at the time it was really a good market, there was good money in cutting scrag blocks, you know, cutting mini logs. Uh, so as, as the people started realizing, hey, there's, you know, there's, there's a market for this small diameter timber. Well, instead of just getting that, those small logs out of, the t out of the tops, they just started cutting small timber. Right. You know, and so where it used to be, you had no economic reason to over harvest the woods. Really, right. you know, there was only a market for your bigger timber. And so a good operator will just cut your the bigger timber and the small stuff will stay and grow up and it's truly renewable. Well, once they started being able to process and market that small diameter stuff, they did. <laughs> sure enough, they did. And it, they buy it by the ton and it's a bulk big time production deal and so you know we've just lost so much of our forest to that kind of logging and it's you know they're just trying to work us out of a job is mm. what it is you know and to me uh and i i'm sure there's lots that'll if they ever hear me say this give me grief but that's okay because it's the way i feel you know i wish that there was a state minimum on stumpage i wish that it was illegal to cut under like a 24 inch stump or something like that you know what i mean and that's unpopular but the thing is is that you know with there's there's a lot of logging in our area and there's a lot of mills and there's a lot of people that need that money and so you know we're just the industry is trying to work itself out of a job is what it is hi i'm joe mishka of rural heritage magazine i'm on location of one of the many events we cover that celebrates our rural heritage if you enjoy our show, check out our magazine, where you'll learn more about the people that blend the past with what works today. You can save almost 20% off the newsstand price by subscribing at ruralheritage.com or chat with us at 877-647-2452. That's toll free, 877-647-2452. Where did you two meet? Where were you, where were you both when you met? We were in West Virginia at um, a fiddler's convention. And where are you from? I'm from Washington State. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whereabouts? Um, uh, partly in north central Washington, small orchard town, 
and then partly in Bellingham, which is north of Seattle. Okay, all right, mm -hmm. close to the coast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you met at a convention? Fiddler's convention, yeah. yeah. What does that mean? It's just a bunch of people playing old time music, fiddles, banjos, guitars, square dancing. camping out, square dancing. Yeah. Had you been leading a similar life? Had yeah. You been yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What What do I call that? Are you guys vagabonds? Are you? <laughs> what are you? Do you have a word uh, for it? Travelers? Is I don't know. Uh, I never called it anything. Right. Yeah. I'm sure you didn't. Some, yeah. some call us bums were, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I didn't really have much in the way of formal education. Um, I, uh, I guess now you'd call it unschooling. I think at the time I just didn't go to school. Okay. Uh, and s sort of off and on homeschooled until about sixth grade. Okay. And at that point, you know, my folks had taught me to read and write and do basic enough math not to get ripped off at the sawmill, you know, that kind right. of thing. And, um, and then I just took it from there, just went to work pretty much and, and, uh, hadn't looked back. So. When I was in my middle teens, uh, I left here and did a lot of traveling, and went all over the all over the world, really. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. And then when Aviva and I met and got together, we moved back home and settled here. All right. Well, let's back up. Where okay. all in all over the world did you go? A, a lot of places, Joe. Um, this, well, you know, I played fiddle and guitar and banjo and and I enjoyed playing music and I'd travel here and there and, and play music and, um, and uh, yeah. all, all over the U.S. Oh yeah, pretty well every state in the U.S. So are you playing for your room and board at this point or? Well, I was, <laughs> we were riding freight trains and so there wasn't much room and board was found where board could be found. Who's we? Uh, Aviva and I together towards the end there for the last couple of years and, uh, I was by myself a lot with that, but I also had several friends, you know, peers, boys my age, or a little older maybe, that were also um, living that way, and we'd kind of cross paths and travel together a while and, and branch off, and, and I, I just, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed riding freight trains and traveling and seeing things, and uh, it was a lot of fun, and I met a lot of nice people everywhere I went. When I was 17, I got with some other boys that were riding the freight, and uh, and I went on one or two trains with them, and then uh, and then I just kept it going. And I just really liked it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Who taught you to play musical instruments? Uh, lots of people. Okay. I had some neighbors when I was a kid that played music, and I l learned all the basics from them. And then um, around that same time, 16, 17 years old, I went. I started going to my first square dances and really liked that music a lot. And and learned a lot from people I'd meet there and, and also old recordings too. I really like old recordings of the old time music and um, so I learned a lot from listening to. <laughs> so all over the country, um, yeah. Uh, from from all four corners of the country, um, everywhere yeah. in between. Yeah, the country is it not just this country here, but the United States of America, and also all over Canada and and Mexico, and uh, we've been to India and Euro Europe, and we've been to Europe, of Europe, a couple parts of Europe and Central America. So we just didn't quit; <laughs> just kept it going. Yeah. We were just young people out seeing what was to be seen, you know, we yep. were just out enjoying what you was make out it there. sound like it's no big deal, so you must have met other people who were also doing that. Yeah, I would say that wasn't too uncommon. I mean, you know, it's definitely a, a subculture around it, you know, and, um, but yeah, there was lots of, at least at the time we were doing it, there was lots of other. I don't know if it out. was any less common than like horse logging. <laughs> yeah, there's right. that. When you think right. about it, you right. know, yeah. when you, when that's what you're doing, you meet more and more people that are doing that. Right. Kind of normalizes it probably. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it's definitely true that when you're by yourself, you, one of the reasons why people migrate to a magazine like mine is that it makes them feel less, less crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> oh, there's other weirdos just like us. Right. I had more free money then than I do now, for sure. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> now you're part of the rat race. A little bit. We, we, we've kind of more or less designed 
tried to engineer our way of life to where we don't have to race too hard. Yeah. You know, I mean, we've got to earn and survive and everything, but we, we bought this, we, when we moved back home, we lived in a small house at my folks' farm and helped out with that family business. Mm -hmm. So lived for free and, and helped with the business and then saved all our money. I was making $13 an hour as a carpenter when we bought this house and we, were, we actually had saved and we paid cash for it. Aviva made more money. She was building guitars, but we we just lived cheap, saved money, and and because we didn't want, we knew we didn't want to have a big mortgage, you know. So we and got lucky, you know, that it was cheaper then mm -hmm. for sure than it is now. Yeah, we definitely have bills to pay now, but we don't have debt, so that's a big freedom. Yeah, yeah the, the banks don't have nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> I'll work anywhere down to from 10 acres up to I've, I've, there's a track of timber over here in Madison County that I work off and on that's 700 acres and uh, and a lot of the time this isn't always the case but a lot of the time it seems like I'm working for other working class people that have family land you know farmers that are raising cows and hay and have a wood lot you know and they want to cut that timber you know and so most of the people I work for need the money. You know, it, it, it's important to them. Um, some of my landowners, too, of my landowners are, are independently wealthy. And so for them, it's, you know, maybe, maybe the income from it, but maybe also just a form of management for their wood lot. You know, but I'd say most of the time, I, you know, and I have to compete with the skitter loggers um, for sure. I don't have I don't really get away with much because I'm using horses. It might make my operation more um, appealing appealing to the landowner, but not to the point where they'll take any less money for their timber. Um, which I'm fine with that. I you know I want to I want to I want this thing to be viable and competitive. You know, so I try to stay right in there with the skitter men as far as what I pay for the timber I buy. Um, and as far as the lay of the land, I mean you've seen it. And Joe, it's pretty rough and rocky and, and steep in lots of places. Um, and the whole deal for me is, you know, I I get my logs from the stump to the mill. You know, I every log I cut, I haul and deliver, you know. And so um, I try to get my truck as close as I can. You know, I've got the side loading truck and I try to find the old log roads and clear them off as best I can and get the truck close. And, and then uh, I bunch it all out with the horse and, and she does a great job. How long you been doing this? Logging full time with horses, coming on two years, um, but I would say the last eight years I've had some kind of logging operation going to some capacity with a with a tractor and a sawmill and you know, but full full time just logging with horses been coming on two years. And you've been doing the math enough to to, to think you can make a living at it. There. Yeah, yeah, I make about what I was making as a lead carpenter. Really? Yeah. Okay. Which, in this area, is not, you know, working people in Arkansas are still more or less ants, you know, or pretty, uh, it's, there's not a whole lot, you know, like a lead carpenter doesn't make here what they're going to make in, in Memphis or, little, or you know, we're, uh, you know, about like $25 an hour, you know, is probably the clear money I make, you know. Which is good, but for around here, that's great money, you know. It's right. but I know people in, you know, in other places that make twice that, right? Doing the same work, you know, carpenter work or whatever. So right, is a dozen eggs cheaper here? I don't know. Eggs? I haven't bought eggs for so long. Right. I can't. Right. <laughs> uh, but I would say yes. The cost of living here used to be a lot cheaper. Land here used to be a lot cheaper, but that's not really the case anymore. Land has gotten really, really out of sight, and so. Eventually, carpenters and, you know, eventually labor is going to have to come up, you know, the value of it. Um, you know, it's just the higher it gets in California or Texas or Chicago or wherever, you know, the more people are going to come out to the country and come to. And two, one thing going against us in a way is that Fayetteville is a, is a very desirable or has become so is a desirable college town. Um, lots of outdoors opportunities. It's pretty scenic, you know, and so um, 
And when I was a kid, I mean, Fayetteville was, was sawmills, was stockyards, was, you know, milk plant. It was very industrial even, and I'm not very old, you know. I still remember when there was feed mills, you know, and all that stuff. And so, you know, um, that's been a big change for us in our area. The, the feed mill is a, is a housing complex now, you know, so. Yeah. I think that good farming and forestry practices are really important not just for our own way of life, but for the environment. And I wanna see that perpetuated and grow. And I want, you know, I, like young people are important because they're young and they're the future. And I want, if I can do anything to help other young people see that it, this is not just a hobby for retired people that have lots of time and money to have a hobby farm or something that it's a it, it is you have to work hard and you have to be frugal but it is a totally reasonable way of life for a young working family to raise their family on and I feel like I don't see many examples of that and I'm not going to say I'm a good example of that but we are we are making a living and we're raising a family working horses I, I don't think I'm exemplary by any means in that but I, I just, I want more people to see that it is, it is a feasible way of life. I would like to thank, I've had many, many people that have helped me get along that I would not be here without. That I, that, and I could sit here saying thank you all day, but as far as horse logging goes and, and making a living day after day, uh, I've had four mentors that I would not be making a living without and I want to say a sincere thank you to all four of them and that's Bob Tabor in Mountain View, Missouri, Woody Roberts lives over in Greene County, Missouri, Jeff Fergie in Somerville, Tennessee and Carl Eldridge at Colcord, Oklahoma. And without those four men who have been there for me night and day with help and advice in every way I would not be making a living and so I want to say thank you. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information. Or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.